Hello there and welcome back to the Music Career Show. My guest today is one who I've admired for quite a while now. She is a fiddle player, singer-songwriter, and is probably the most energetic busker that I've ever seen. <laughs> she, she released her debut single last year and styles herself as a happy mix of Mumford & Sons and Clannet, which I think is absolutely fantastic. So this is Meg Legrand. Hello, Barry. Thanks a million for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to have you, Meg. How are you doing? Are you well? I am keeping so well. Yes, Good yes. Stuff. So for people that may not have heard of you just yet, Meg, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what it is that you do? Brilliant. Yeah, well, I'm a full-time musician and I live on the west coast of Ireland now, but spent many years living in Dublin, uh, busking and doing the Temple Bar circuit and playing with bands and weddings, whatever, wherever I, whenever I get a call is where I go. Um, and yes, so I'm based on the west coast and I play music full-time in an assortment of arrangements. Very good. And how does like how does a, a, a typical week look for you as a professional musician in the West of Ireland? Yeah, well, no. Well, for many years when I was in Dublin, it was a lot more hectic. Um, but I guess it's just kind of a mark of like my career moving in a different way. And my big theme for this year in 2023 is kind of like working smarter, not harder. So it used to look like, you know, two street shows a day and then a temple bar gig and then maybe a few wedding gigs during the week. But now what's after happening from Grafton Street is that I've been able to create over a few years a really refined show that's great for corporate events, weddings, um, cruise ships. Actually, I got um, a oh, cruise cool. liner gig from the Fringe over the summer. So yeah, I've kind of worked through all of the, the kinks, shall we say. Grafton has been an amazing laboratory for experimenting with all this kind of thing over the years. And now I've exported that show. To different agencies so i live in the west and my week looks like like a handful of uh, kind of corporate gigs a week or like local bar gigs uh, weddings whatever um very good kind of do that cool. I'm, I, I'm really interested to get get stuck into that um but let's re reverse just for a little bit so where did um so where, where did it all start for you like how did you get into music did you were you brought up in, in with music or what's the crack yeah so i actually grew up in canada i grew up in ottawa canada <laughs> And then I went, yeah, my dad is an amazing banjo player and he took up guitar later in life. My dad is a fantastic musician. Um, and so dad got me into music and he would sit with me uh, and practice with me every day. Uh, I was not allowed to go to birthday parties on the weekend if there was orchestra. <laughs> it was very, Aww. yeah, no, but it was great. Like it, it yeah. was fantastic and I'm so grateful to him. And um, so it was all from my dad. The love of music came and he was very encouraging my whole life. Very good. So what was your first instrument then? Uh, fiddle. Well, the violin, I started learning classical. Um, but then when I was, uh, I went to an arts high school um, in Canada called Canterbury High School. And it was just a playground. It was so fun. We had like dancers, musicians, like everything. You had your full academic program. It was a public right. school. But then you had to audition to get in for a specialized arts program. So it was oh, a bit cool. wild. Like Arcade Fire, one of the dudes from Arcade Fire went to our high school and they did a charity concert in our cafeteria. <laughs> So mental. Like, yeah, mental. It was it was so much fun. And um, so that was when I really began collaborating with other musicians, dancers, bands. And every summer I would go to fiddle camp because I'm very cool. <laughs> See, that, that's something that just doesn't exist over this end of the world. Know, that's you, slugged if you went to yeah. fiddle camp in Ireland. Use, that, you, use that's over that end of the world in, in, in Canada and the States yeah. and stuff. You do, like, you've got a camp for everything. You do everything so much better than we do. We <laughs> half arse everything over this end. It's just like, eh, just listen to them play and do that. It's grand. Yeah. But like you have like proper like specialized things and everything. So like what did the, so yeah, that, that really intrigues me because um, on, on, on a previous podcast, I, I was speaking about like me doing music and stuff in school. And like we did, I had to stay behind on a Thursday evening to actually do music lessons in first year of secondary school because there was no music in the curriculum, like oh, at all. Yes, yes. Yeah. And like we used to have, <laughs> this sounds terrible, but we used to have music in a, a, a classroom called the library, which had nothing in it. There was no books. There was no, it wasn't a library. It was just a big open space. But that's where we had the, uh, it eventually became the music room, I think. But um, so to hear that you went to a special school, not a special school, yes. but you went to a school that had a specific yeah. um, music program. What did that look like? I actually, you know what? And, you know, I know people, a lot of people have a hard time in high school, but I actually, my high school experience changed the course of my life. And yeah, I can imagine. the people I met there um, and even to this day, peers from my classes 
are now working in the industry and like I call them up and like we share resources and advice Amazing. and the same with fiddle camp like all of my gal pals from like the fiddle competition circuit not that I did very many competitions but like we all would uh, come to this camp basically yeah. teach each other tunes and like now they're all working and touring and we pass gigs around and tours around and like my friend went to the Berkeley College of Music and she runs an amazing cool. school in Halifax now and um Mary Mary Time uh, folk school is class in Mary Time music class. school. Um, but uh, but I call her up for advice all the time because sure she was after studying at Berkeley and I'm like yo what do I do in this situation and it's just amazing. So between fiddle camp and 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 my high school it was class and the way the high school looked was um, we had um, like the music department which had vocal strings and then woodwinds and then nice. you had the dancers and then you had visual arts and then you had literary arts for creative writing. Um and drama and wow. yeah, dance. It was just class. <laughs> yeah. So did you have like specific lessons? Like so you go to mats in the morning and then you'd have like yes. violin in, in Exactly. The- yeah. But um but like an intense kind of classical violin program and actually and it was because of it's funny how it all worked, but if it wasn't for Canterbury, like I would not be on this trajectory now. And it's yeah. so funny because um, I got really it was it was catastrophic for me at the time. And I can say it's funny now because after working through that traumatic time, I can really appreciate it because I, I wasn't able to actually play my violin for my final year. I got really, really bad tendonitis. It was crippling. I could uh. not. Play. My hands, like I, they were like, it was just devastating. And there. I was preparing for university auditions um, and I was practicing like five hours a day and I had orchestra on the weekend. Like I'd get up at 6 a.m. and do two hours or like an hour and then go to school and then do another like two or three yeah. hours in the evening. But like, but then between homework, it was just mad. So, um, yeah. anyway, my body gave out, and I, the, my teacher, they were like, "Look, um, we can just pass you for your final year, but we know you have a good work ethic, and we know that that wouldn't sit right with you. Would you like to go across the hall and learn how to sing?" And uh-huh. he was like, "Oh, I, oh shit!" And like the thing is, because we had our graduation recital at the um, National Arts Center in in Ottawa. It's like. It's a big venue, like, <laughs> and, yeah, and, I, and I was like, oh my God, I had to like walk out and sing like some freaking Italian aria. <laughs> so, nice. so But it was great. And you know what? I squawked it out. It was so bad. It was act. I, I, I studied the whole year. I had this vocal coach. I did not know how to sing. I was like 17, squawking it out. And it was so bad. But like everyone like gave me the biggest round of applause because I had a lot nice. of hope. <laughs> yeah. It was a great lesson because then it kind of like, I was like, okay, you like throw yourself into the fire. Like your nerves are all burnt off after that. You can't feel anything now. Like that's not yeah. to say I don't get nervous, but I was like, okay, I did that. And now I can do anything really. <laughs> I I had a very similar experience in that. Well, no, no, I actually, in fact, I didn't have a similar experience in the slightest. But what I mean, what I mean by that is, is with the nerves is that I, I got nervous before the very first ever gig that I ever did was, which was at, at my school. I was like, I think it must've been 13 or 14. And we played at like the talent show. And I was um, still to this day, not a great singer. I'm, I'm a singer out of necessity, not out mm-hmm. of great talent. Mm-hmm. But um, and I got nervous before the first one. Mm-hmm. And after that, I was like, well, what's the point in getting nervous? Like, what was like, what did that achieve? Absolutely nothing. That was great crack. What am I getting nervous for? It's the same sort of thing. Exactly. It's funny, like some gigs I like, I don't get nervous for at all. Like, and it can be for thousands of people, like not oh, yeah. nervous. But then if it's a small room with a few like people that I really respect and yep. whose opinion matters to me, it, then yep. of course you want to, you want to do the best and you can. So there's a lot of, it's very much like a mental workout, just celebrating the fun and the crack of your craft. And I Ex- find that exactly. by doing that and zoning in on that, it really helps with any kind yeah, of. Exactly. I hate doing like, um, well, that, that sounds terrible, uh, but I, I, I always get kind of exactly like, like what you're saying, worked up and, and kind of, overthink uh yeah. when i'm doing weddings or something like that something that's yeah. important when there's a, a a select group of it's it's grand going and playing in the local irish pub where people are going to go in they're going to have the crack regardless but when people are are there for a very specific reason such as a wedding and you're in charge of the crack that sort of um it's uh it's a bit of a responsibility and uh yeah i, I yeah totally. um, yeah so you said you got tendonitis and stuff. How long did that last for? And how did you get over that? Several years, actually. Like, so I had it for two or three years really badly. Jesus. Yeah. And, um, but during that time, I, so I, then I went into university for something 
completely unrelated to music. I did an undergrad in international development and history, which ended up right. leading me on the path that I needed to be to do music full time, ironically. Really? So I ended up doing a third year exchange um, to Galway, to NUIG. And that's what brought me to Ireland for the first time. I did my Erasmus year at NUIG and I just got stuck into trad. I was like, I kind of, I chose Ireland because I was like, okay, I can tap into music. I knew I wanted to go into music and my arms yeah. were getting better. So I was like, okay, you know, this would be a great year to learn new tunes and uh, tap into the folk scene. And so, yeah, I did that. Spent every night of the week, like in T. Coley's and the Crane and Nocton's and just playing music, learning the concept, nice. learning the material. And meanwhile, I was still practicing singing and still taking lessons. And from that year, I met one of my best friends, Emma O'Sullivan. Maybe, you, maybe you've bumped into her if you're a fan of uh, any buskers in Galway over the years, but she's a phenomenal Shano dancer. And what? she's just one of my very best friends. And Emma, I met in the pub and she had just come back from China. And I was like, yo, what were you doing in China? And she said, oh, like I was touring with the Rhythm of the Dance. It's like through the National Dance Company of Ireland. Yeah. And I said, no way. And I was like, they do like world tours? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, whoa, do they need a fiddle player? And she's like, yeah, the fiddle player is leaving next year. She said, send in your press kit. So I sent it in. She gave me their email. I sent it in and I didn't hear anything back. And I finished my last year of uni back in Canada being like, yeah. this is in no way related to the kind of career that I want to build for myself. I need to get back to Ireland. How am I going to do this? And then the call came. I got an email. Well, it was an email like two weeks before. And they're like, hey, are you free to go to Japan in two weeks? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and they only Wait. hired me actually because I was a singer. By that point, I've been singing for a few years. And right. they only hired me because I could do both. And they didn't want to hire two people. So it worked out great. Fair play. That's amazing. So you've been to Japan as well. You're like yes. the fourth person that I've interviewed that has uh, gigged in Japan. And it's like my biggest goal in life is to go to Japan. And like do stuff because like I love like like Nintendo and Pokemon and all that other shit. I'm such a nerd with that sort of stuff. And I think and like I only yesterday I was like how I was I was googling. It's like how do you make instant ramen noodles healthy? So like I'd love to go to like Japan and like figure out how they do. Yeah, there you go. Oh, um, so good. Like <laughs> yeah. And what what was um what was Japan like then gigging as like Irish trad? It was like a fever dream. It was the most outrageous gig of my life. Like it's actually like a bit of a, it's like a fever dream. So they basically, the dance company, it was a small like B troop that was sent. It wasn't the main troop. So it was a smaller troop uh, and it was a residency at a Dutch themed amusement park in the Nagasaki countryside. So we, it was out, so, it was, so like basically we, we, it was very near Sasebo, which is okay. like, in an interesting place, like it, there was a lot of American Navy influence. And then you had this cross culture of like Japanese style hamburgers and like all of these American Navy folks walking around. And then in the hills, then there was uh, Amsterdam, actually. And it was a meticulous re re reconstruction of downtown Amsterdam. And Maybe. like they had the palace, they had the canals, um, all of the employees wore wooden clogs with aprons and... And we and we were on this stage for their Christmas season doing an Irish Celtic show production. And so it was a hoot. And on our days off, we just would go exploring Japan. Like I took the like the the bullet train like up to uh, Kyoto for a day and just it's wild. Yeah, it was so cool. Literally half of my TikTok is like me following people that like just do stuff in Japan. I'm so yeah. jealous. Uh, ah, that's well, there's so lots of opportunities. Like, there's this is the thing about Irish music. There is an insatiable appetite. We like with this particular genre, you can literally gig anywhere in the world. The Irish diaspora is huge, and it's so influential. There's always a demand. You can find gigs anywhere doing this particular yep, genre. Absolutely, and we all know each other. Just before we started <laughs> recording, for anyone know, for, like just before we start recording, um. Uh, I, I, I just a very very quick backstory for people listening. Uh, I was trying to get get a hold of Meg because we were we seemed to be having a bit of technical difficulties. So I went and found her on Facebook, and I was like, oh, two mutual friends. Who are they? One of the lads went to school with me, and the other fella I toured America with, and we we just know each other through uh, mutual friends. And like I'm in Aberdeen, um, Meg is in uh, the west coast of Ireland, and yeah, uh, yeah we, we we might as well be as as far away in the world as each other, but we're, we might as well be across the across the road as well. It's mental. Like you're saying, the, the, the Irish diaspora. What does that, what does diaspora mean? 
like an external group of people. So like when the famine happened, all the Irish people left Ireland, but yeah. the community still exists kind yes. of on the periphery Brilliant. of Ireland. So there you go. There's there's your international development uh, degree yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah. Handy. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, you're teaching amazing. me stuff. I I never even heard of. But yeah, it's it's it, it is amazing. And I I always people always think that's mental because again, I've got students that come uh uh for 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 lessons. One, it's a brother and sister. One's ukulele. And one's a guitar. And their uncle gigs in. I think it's in Dubai, in the Irish village. And I know <laughs> lads that gig in the Irish village in in Dubai who know him. It's oh, meant. It's absolutely meant. As uh, the the song goes, no matter where you go in the world, if you can pull a pint or sing a song, you're grand. You're absolutely and, and Irish. Do you know what I mean? Or or can kind of relate to, to the Irish uh, sort of things. But I just um, have to say, I had such a moment. Like at the, well, the, whenever I okay, so for years, like it's been a journey. I've now officially submitted for Irish citizenship, but oh, in order so. to get to that point, it was almost impossible. And it was so, and I was like, I just want to be Irish, man. But like, I was like, I know that I'm well on my way when it finally happens. And what it is, is when you're speaking to an Irish person, whether you're abroad or you don't know them, but you're like, oh, you're from this place. Do you know this person? And it keeps happening to me now because I'm like, I've been here long enough and like, you're always like one degree of separation away from someone. Yeah, you know. no, I, 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 yeah, not not even one degree. My wife goes mental because she's like, "How do you know that person?" I was like, I, "I'll I'll see someone walking down the road." I was like, "Oh, that looks like so and so." And nine times out of ten, it 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 will be. And she's like, "Irish people have this weird obsession with asking you where, asking people where they're from." And then if they, it is, it's so true. No matter where you go in the world. Oh, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm, I'm from, I, I'm from Carberry. I'm from, you're from Carberry. I'm from Eden Derry. Five minutes down the road. Jesus, do you know so-and-so? So, yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. So, yeah, in fairness, you're, you, 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 you do a good impression of an Irish person already. Uh, for anyone that isn't, that can't see this, that can't, isn't watching the, the video, Meg, it, or doesn't know what Meg looks like, Meg, it has got really long, lovely ginger hair, um, kind of freckles, and talks with an almost Irish accent. So, like, you're, you're, yeah. you're nearly there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're nearly there, and you probably play um trad fiddle better than most musicians that I know. So like you're, nah, that's very kind. You're well on the way. So how does that uh, how does that work? How do you go through getting Irish citizenship? Have you got to marry an Irish person there? Well, I bribed one of the buskers on Grafton Street one day. It was looking like it was looking like it. You know, I didn't know a way forward, and I said, John, if I pay you ten grand, will you marry me? And he was like, ten grand, yeah. And I was like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not have 10 grand, but I was like, realistically, like, it's going to cost me that much over the next few years if I don't figure this out. Like, yeah. between, like having to pay international student fees or whatever. And I was yeah, like, yeah. Well, hook a quill out. Like, <laughs> yeah. I come to that. And I was only kind of half joking, but <laughs> yeah. No, but the way I ended up getting it was through a series of visas and work permits over the years. And so okay. I, after five years on a certain level of uh, work permit, uh, you can, you are eligible for citizenship. So. Brilliant. Well, yeah, so congratulations on, on um, converting and, and joining yeah. the winning side. Yes, the winning side is right. <laughs> I know, that, that, that's very, very arrogant, isn't it? So, uh, no, no, Canadians just, are absolutely sound. It's just the truth. I love my people. I love my Canadians, but I love my other people as well. I love the Irish as well. So, so have you got any other Irish connections or is it literally just because you came over here for university or what? Yeah. Or come, come over here. I'm in Scotland. Went over there for yeah. Yeah, university. Yeah, yeah. No, I came for university uh, to the West Coast and then um, I came for the music, really, because uh, I knew I wanted a career in it. And I thought, well, the society tells me I'm going to fail at being a musician. And mm -hmm. I said, if I'm going to fail. I'm going to do it in a blaze of glory. Like I'm yeah. going to do it having the time of my life. You and, might as well be having the crack, yeah. And, and by actually giving myself the best chance that I had to succeed. So I kind of had to have, take a step back and say, okay, doing what I do, I'm a fiddle player, I'm a singer, and I love the folk rock genre, I love the singer-songwriter genre, I, I love the storytelling that comes with the singer-songwriter genre, and mm -hmm. Ireland has that in its bones, in mm -hmm. the fabric of its society, you are storytellers. Um, and so it just made sense to base myself here, and because I just knew if, if I surround myself by people doing the same thing, Hopefully, opportunities will come, and that's exactly what happened. So, fair play, excellent. So, do, what what does success look like for you then? Actually, yeah, I reflect on that a lot because when you're in a career where you're self-employed, you don't have the traditional benchmarks of success. 
So that's uh-huh. something that I struggle with. And that's something that's taken a lot of mindfulness and intention setting around. And by the way I deal with that and the way I, I, I am a perfectionist and I get, well, I'm a perfectionist until a point. Like there's sometimes where I just don't give a fuck. And if something sounds a bit shit in a video online, I'm like, whatever, I don't care. Yeah. I know I'm competent. I, I'm confident with my craft. That might have been a bit shit on the street, but whatever. It's a live show in the street. Well, what do you expect? You know, exactly. yes. but anyway, but with certain, but anyway, but I'm very, I, 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 I get down and out easily, and my my very good friends know this because I, well, because I have such high standards for myself, because I want to, because I want to do a lot with my craft, and then mm-hmm. from my craft, I like develop a business and do these kinds of things. I need when when it doesn't happen quickly, I get pissed off at myself, <laughs> but. But things take time. And my friend said something really great to me. She said, Megan, the goals you have are hard. Like a lot of people's goals are like, I want to play a show or I want to do something else, which are freaking fantastic goals. And those were my goals before. But now my goals have changed and they've become harder now that I've met my original goals. And so when I don't reach them, I get discouraged. And so the way that I can keep track and keep stock of my success is to, is to set really attainable benchmarks. And, and once I meet them myself, I'm like, okay, you can literally sit back and look at that now, Megan, and say, you have made progress. You can stop being hard on yourself. You have achieved these forms of success. And so yeah. like, for me, one of the things was like, okay, a single in a music video, that's in line with my goals. I want to be a creator as well as a session player. So I just want to start creating. And so I did that and that felt good. That was a, you know, a benchmark of success. But then I'm like, I want it in a Celtic elf movie. <laughs> Why hasn't it happened yet? And then I'll get down and out. <laughs> yeah. I know I, you're, 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 you're preaching to the choir there because I am exactly the same. I have no patience and I'm just full of ideas, 99% of which are just useless. But there will be one, one little idea there that I'll, kind of la- that I'll be able to latch on to and then make um, something out of it. And um, it's 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 one of these things that I say in every single episode, and I say this in every single episode, and I say it in every single episode. But it's when I was a kid, I wanted to be a rock star, and that was it. But it was like that was because you didn't really know how to measure what success would feel like, and in in your mind, that's that that that's where you need to get to to feel happy or to feel content and feel successful. But like you're saying, it it doesn't necessarily. You have to think right. Some people. While they'd love to be rock stars, what what they actually mean is that they want to be able to feel like rock stars by going and doing an open mic and doing two two songs at an open mic might be their net worth. Do you know what yes. I mean? Um, and and that that was kind of where where it was 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 getting at. But like, what was your benchmark for success? If you if you do consider yourself successful now and successful and um self sufficient and all that kind of crack you've clearly made a career out of it what 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 did that look like and does it how does it differ from or does it differ from what you're at now is it like the success that i have now is that something is that that, what you were aiming for is that what i was aiming for uh no no well yes and no so again i like it's so funny because i've been doing a lot of reflection on this topic recently actually because i was like okay you have you can't be so hard on yourself like you're making a living out of music megan you're getting your irish citizenship yeah you're getting calls to go gig in scotland and london and like you've turned down the irish show world because you want to have a different career than that now yeah and and like you're having success with that it's taken time and first of all i can live off my music which is mm-hmm. crazy you know like it's mad, isn't it yeah it's mad. And I could, and so I was like, okay, that's success. Like, that's good. Mm. Now, I, the kind of, so I guess at the moment, so I guess, yes, I, I do feel successful. And as I say that, I don't feel successful because my, my, my goals have not been met. However, I they've reached into the choir. Absolutely. Yeah. However, I have to take stock and say, yeah, I'm successful. Well, of course I am. But yeah. I'm like, oh God, is that even? I'm like, oh, God, really? <laughs> you know, but I am, of course, of course I am, you know. And um, so it is even like writing down things that I'm proud of, accomplishments that I'm proud of, just to have something visual that I can look at has been very helpful. Um, like, like even over the summer, I was asked to put together 
um, a band uh, for a, a brilliant, it was a trad band for um, a brilliant wedding of music industry professionals. Oh, cool. And Hosier played at the wedding and oh, cool. uh, he performed with us. And like, Andrew's the nicest guy ever. And like, at the end, he went to like, like to, at the end, he just went to us and that was, that was class. And it was easy to play with you, basically. Brilliant. And, and the, that's the, the best like, compliment you can get as a musician, yeah. that it was easy to play, play along with Yeah, him. he had said that to, to the group. Uh, so it was really nice. Um, yeah. So and I was like, yeah. And I was like, whoa. And I knew these people to bring them together. You know, as I was like, wait, like that's an accomplishment to have worked in an industry long enough to know the best people to call yeah. for a particular event. So it, it, what I, so again, that's not a traditional benchmark in perhaps no. a nine to per, perhaps in like a nine to five configuration, you'll know that if you work a certain number of years and you do this, 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 and this, um, you will be eligible for promotion. Um, but we are totally responsible for our, the celebration of our growth when we're self-employed. Uh -huh. So something like that. Th so what I've realized that I can take pride in is like, okay, you've really cut, like gotten your stripes over the years doing the rough and tumble gigs in Temple Bar. Um, and then, you know, and then the brilliant gigs that come out of that too. And like the, yeah. and then the, um, the Celtic show world and through that and through those hard works and hard, that hard work and long hours, you know, brilliant musicians and you've been yeah. through the fire together and now I can put them together and create something cool for different things that I get called for. So that's progress. That's something yeah. to be proud of. Yeah. That's absolutely, that, 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 that's a better answer than I could have ever hoped for. Cause that's, that you, you, you've hit the nail on the head there with like, it's not like the nine to five where you can like reliably forecast where your career is going to go. So if yes. I put in X amount of hours, and do X amount of this, that, and the other, I will arrive at this point in X amount of years. It, that doesn't happen for us as musicians and as, as self-employed at all. It all does depend on how much we put into it. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly as as you said. I'll probably edit out that last little bit there of me just well, rambling. Whatever, yeah, yeah. Up, but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, just, just uh, as, a, as, as an aside. I think you have absolutely hit the nail on the head there. And I am going to use that uh, yeah. nine to five format. Like you just yeah. said, it doesn't work that way. That's fantastic. And cool. actually, and I'll share this resource on the podcast as well. Now I'm working um, with a mentor right now. So I'm working with a fantastic person at the moment who um, uh, just, we literally a few days ago had an amazing three hour uh, session and uh, the thing that I have been struggling with this month, because this month has actually been quiet and it's been quiet because I kind of turned down some gigs. So I was really feeling tired. Like I, it had been uh -huh. a chaotic four months before that with the fringe and yeah. everything else. And so I was like, no, I just need to rest because then December is crazy again. And yeah. again, and then, but then I knew that, but I felt so guilty about mm -hmm. not working. And I was, I was like, oh, I need to be working every single day because everyone else works this schedule. And I said this to my mentor, I was like, Peter Jack, I was like, how do I not feel guilty about this? And how do I actually rest productively yeah. and allow myself that? And he said, me, the framework that we have been taught about the nine to five, that works very, very well for the people who work in that, within those parameters. Uh -huh. Because you cannot take that mold and put it into our sector. It the mold is it does not work. It no. simply does not. It's not a compatible structure for what we do. Yeah. What you he says, Megan. What does and then and he's like, okay, it was like it was like gonna be all like David Attenborough. He's like, we'll use a metaphor. We'll use a metaphor. And he's like, okay, does like the peregrine falcon fly around all day looking for its prey? No, it chills in its nest. It sleeps. It sleeps. The peregrine falcon sleeps. And it chills. And then it's like, I'm hungry now. And then it flies down, exerts all of its energy, catches a mouse, then goes back. And he might just do that twice a week. You know, that's uh -huh. what we do. It's working smarter, not harder. So I need to like, I'm currently unpackaging the guilt that's been, uh, you know, that, that society is around. I'm currently unpackaging guilt around rest and society and capitalism making uh -huh. us feel that we have to work that hard all of the time. You can work differently and there's yep. nothing to feel guilty about working differently. Yeah. 
or that, 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 again, you're preaching to the choir because I'm at the moment putting together a coaching service for musicians to do exactly that. So you're talking about um, this um, corporate event sort of package that you can deliver to um to, to people and stuff like that. Is that your um like your looping show and stuff? Yeah, sure. Right. Is, yeah. So, now looping is something that com- that not that it never interested me. That's the wrong way to put it. But it my brain usually turns off because I well, tried well, well, it. I tried it and I just too, Henry. mine too. <laughs> yeah, well well I I tried it and I just couldn't make my brain work that way. But when I saw you doing it, it was just such a, a kind of a fresh way of doing it because oh, so many people just go and do loops and stuff with like guitars and they're all trying to, or what they used to all try to be like Ed Sheeran or Katie Tunstall when she started out doing it. But when I saw you doing it with your, your fiddle, I thought it was absolutely um, genius. So like, how did you, how, how, how did you find looping and how did you get to where you are? Well, um, as I'm sure you know, being a musician, the violin, the fiddle, it's not a chordal instrument. It's not mm-hmm. a traditional instrument for accompaniment of a, vo- of a voice. So I was like, okay, I have an option. I want to write songs. And I said, I can either learn guitar or I can use this technology to create soundscapes that allow me to sing over it. And yeah. fiddle being my heart and soul and like my passion, I was like, well, I want to play my fiddle. So I'll find a way to do this with my fiddle. And it just spiraled from there. So, um, what I'll do now is I'll just start writing arrangements uh, that I hear in my head and then I'll add vocal harmonies, a drum sample. And once I am happy with an arrangement, the lyrics come. And so that's how I create original music. Um, now I've started to learn guitar as well just because it's, it's great to learn and it makes me more marketable as a session player as well. So um, More employable. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, yeah, all about diversifying your skill set. Yeah, always. absolutely, oh, using transferable always. skills and all that kind of crack. This is the absolutely. sort of stuff that I'm, 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 I'm huge on it, huge yeah. on it, and I, I, I applaud everyone and anyone that takes the leap to do that because doing, uh, I, I'd imagine, uh, fiddle for as long as you've done it, it, it can be a little bit kind of, I'd imagine, daunting and kind of like, I, I, I get frustrated. I, I'm the, I'm the opposite. I played guitar for so long that I tried to learn fiddle. And I like I can play mandolin, so I guess the the right hand is or the, sorry the left hand is pretty much the same to an extent, but the 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 whole bowing um aspect of it just completely threw me. And I, and my fiddle teacher told me that I play fiddle like a guitar, which I don't really mm-hmm. understand how that that works, but apparently yeah. I do, and I'm happy enough with that. Um, yeah. but um, yeah, it is. Uh, it's I know for me thinking, right? I've got such I'm I knowing what I know from from other instruments you've got a mountain of stuff that you know you need to get to. And then it's crippling because- And then it's crippling. Yeah. So, and actually I, I'm self-diagnosed ADHD. I need to go get an official oh, diagnosis. Me too. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of creatives, we are neurodivergent. It's our minds, you know, we work yeah. different, we think differently. And so I'm um, only get a diagnosis, but like, there's so much stigma to unpackage with that. Like having ADHD does not mean you have a low IQ. It does not mean that you're bad oh, at no. school. I'm no, really, no. really good at school. I'm really, really good at school. I, yeah. but like, I can't, I, the, the, but what would be hard for me was like sitting down. I couldn't uh-huh. sit down and actually read and then I'd get distracted. It would take me an extra five hours to do a simple task. Whereas yeah. my peers could do it in half the time. So yeah. things like this. So like my, uh, this industry lends, it's like my ADHD is a superpower in this industry yeah. because I lean into it. And then mm-hmm. I can be explosive and do what I need to do with hypervigilance. And it's just been a superpower. It's been great. So, yeah. um, I mean, like sometimes I'm like a, a rabid little, little gerbil. Like I just can't, like I'm buzzing so fast. I'm jumping around playing my fiddle. Like, and I'm like, okay. And even like Peter Jack, like he's great. He's, uh, he's my mentor. And he was like, okay, like there is a lot going on. And we're just going to, we're going to like, we're going to work. We, I'd like to have more to work with than less. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, thanks. Yeah. You know, no, but it's just, um, um, I totally lost my train of thought what we were saying. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no so, so did I, cause I, I'm, I'm exactly, exactly, exactly. I couldn't fall. I, I've had so many jobs in my life that I was horrendous at and got, mm-hmm. I got suspended from jobs. I nearly got sacked from jobs mm-hmm. just because, and not because I couldn't do them is because, not because I was, I was. People didn't like me. Everywhere I've gone in my life, thankfully, people seem to to warm to me and, and 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 all that. And I think people felt bad when they were like getting on to me for the millionth time to do the same job that I've just wasn't doing because I just physically could not force myself. I just couldn't force myself to do into that nine to five 
thing because music was the and, and being creative was the thing that I was meant to do. I've now mm-hmm. found that since I made music my full time, that like the things that like um I used to tinker with guitars constantly. Mm-hmm. So I was always like creating different ideas for guitars and and like foot drums and all this kind of stuff. And I used to just spend my entire working day Googling stuff like that. So I wouldn't be doing the job I was meant to be doing. I'd just be Googling things about like, oh, how can I do X, Y, and Z with a guitar? And um ever since taking on guitar or taking on music as a full uh, full-time job i find i have that creative outlet and i don't need to be searching for other uh different things that i can actually get stuck into what i'm doing um, I, I also find that by the end of the week i'm more knackered than i've ever been in my life um even though i was working yeah. like i used to work seven days a week doing three or four gigs over like even, even maybe six or seven gigs over a weekend and then going to doing a full 95 but um yeah so that mm. is um yeah, I, I, I hear you. Um, I think we were I, talking about the Loop Show. Was that we were what talking about the Loop Show? Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. And how that came about. ADHD. I totally have ADHD. Oh my god. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So, um, uh, uh, so let's let's loop back here. Oh, pun intended. That was great. <laughs> yeah. So right, uh, yeah. Loop back how that all started. Then yeah. So basically, the violin. Yes, the violin, the fiddle. Um, it's not a traditional accompaniment instrument for a voice. So I started building these soundscapes. Um, and at the time, I'd been working in a bar in Dublin. Uh, yeah. I'd first started dappling in looping. But I, I actually, I got fired. And, you know, like rightly so. I, 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 got, I got a last minute festival gig with these uh, amazing musicians from Australia. They're called the Pierce Brothers. And they were playing C sessions. And I met them in the pub like the day before. And they're like, will you come? Will you come to the festival and play with us? And I was like, Fuck yeah. So they picked me up in their tour bus the next morning. Oh, yes. Yeah. And like we went and like had the best time and like uh, it was great crack. But um, but anyway, now in fairness, I, you know, I had, I had asked the manager, um, well, I had gone in very early now to help the manager the day before because the other guy was too hungover and he didn't get fired. Oh, anyway, yeah. it was literally 48 hours earlier. I had done him a solid. I'd come up from Galway to cover his ass and like they know mm-hmm. and then i thought i'd have a bit of good grace you know no it wasn't the case he said clearly music takes priority you're fired never come back he was just like really mean like i was like okay i was like in fairness i deserve yeah. it like i am bailing on this ship but come on like, it, it kind of owed me <laughs> but, yeah, anyway. but, but 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 where is he now uh, yeah he's still he? still angry <laughs> he's still angry yeah actually he ended up getting fired and then I had become, a, so that's why I became a busker because actually it was those lads who kind of put the, put the bug in my ear. They were like, they were great friends with Tash Sultana from Burke Street Mall. They are all buskers in that busking community in Burke Street in Melbourne. And okay. so busking is just something like this is a whole other topic, but it must be protected at all costs because yeah. it is a learning workshop. Every single day I had people who were better than me teaching me about equipment learning how to loop like and the same thing that's why you have incredible artists bursting out of the street culture because yeah. it really forces you to be the best you can be very quickly because you're not going to eat otherwise and other yeah. buskers are better than you it is a pressure cooker of being the best you can be and so those lads they were like yo we made so much they made so much money off Burke street during over the years and i was like they're like you should try busking and i was like oh I'll try, yeah I'll, I'll try busking and yeah. so i then realized very quickly that like I didn't want to just play acoustically because that was I wasn't gonna make any money. Yeah. And I and I had this idea of like looping up covers. So I started looping up covers. So I spent about a week. I had like a week until I had to pay rent or something outrageous. So I maybe it was just a few days. Like I forget. Anyway, I remember I was yeah. like my housemates worked nine to five and it was just like six hours a day, like figuring out these arrangements and getting it yeah. all ready. And then I just got this shitty ass street cube sounded shite it was so trebly it was so Aye, people awful. people think that people swear by them but they're chronic i know yeah, them they're, they're chronic. Oh. sorry i should have said they're actually i think they're grand for like a guitar and singer i think it's great but for me with my instrument the the eq was horrendous like it was so yeah. trebly. it sounded like a tin can with a fiddle going through it you know it just isn't great but anyway bought it went out and i made more money busking in the day than i made at the pub so and that was on my first day so i was like okay i'll just keep going and then everyone was better than me. There was an amazing busker, Jamie Harrison. He's an amazing loop artist. And nice. he was so polished. Like he had been doing it for years. And I was like, I want to be as good as Jamie Harrison. I want to have a circle show with my street show. 
So for yeah. like a year and a half, I watched him. <laughs> yeah, cool. And I was like, uh, oh, I'm going to be your competition, and bro. And then I was, I was his competition. Like, as in like, I was as good as him. So I was pulling the crowd as well at the same time when he was playing. So that's the thing. That's another thing you learn. You know, if there's another busker at the bottom of the street and they're pulling people because they want to watch, pe- the audience wants to watch them. Well, it means you have to be better. It means you have to hone your yeah. show, be better. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. And so, like, if anyone's listening and wanting to get into like looping, so what did you start off with? Like, the like you, your 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 loop pedal could be acting from twenty quid on Amazon to you could go full edge here. And do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, what did you start with? So i i I've always been a fan of the Boss pedal. Um, so I started with the Boss RC thirty. Um, oh, yeah. had that for years. That was great. It's like the pink one. I actually think they've stopped making them. I'm not sure, but now I moved up to the RC three hundred, which is class. It's just Is that the great. full? Mm-hmm. The full size one, like five, six pedals or something. Yeah, so you have six pedals and it's yeah. three sections. So you can do three different arrangements, basically. Very good. Mm, it's great. Very and good. then I love the stop start pedal. So like you can stop it all and then drop it all back in for emphasis. It's great. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. See, that that's what used to, like whenever I tried it, it just, um, I just couldn't get my head around it at all. I can't, I can't really think ahead effectively. I'm like, that's why I'm shy at chess as well. Um, I just can't. My brain just doesn't doesn't work that way. So I I do a a, a one man band gig as well, where mm-hmm. I've got a, a foot drum. So instead of trying to think of Everton, I can layer it all up. I just play Everton at the same time, because that's the only way that I can actually manage to do it. So I've got a drum kit that I play underneath my feet while I'm playing guitar and harmonica and stuff, and it's the only way that I can actually keep track of it. So I am uh, totally in awe of uh, like people that can actually mm-hmm. keep track of stuff in in loops and stuff. Yeah, um, it's brilliant. So for anyone getting getting stuck in, then you'd recommend the boss one, the boss RC. Yeah. I think there is. There's an updated one that's kind of like it's got a fancy little dial on Circles. it. And, and yeah, stuff. I haven't used that yet. It looks class. It looks. Cool. It does look cool. It does. It, it looks like kind of like Night Raider, um, where it's like kind of all the the stuff fl- floats around. But like, so it, when you started out looping, did you just literally start out with like one sort of? I'm not gonna say baseline, but you do you know what I mean? Like one sort of melody loop. And then try and, and build up from that. Or... Yeah. Um, so one thing that you have to do is you have to look for songs that have the same chord progression throughout the entire song. Because yeah. you can't have, because I don't play guitar. So it's not like I could loop up a verse and then play guitar for the chorus and then go back to loop. I just tend not to do that. So I, the only songs I do are ones that have the same ones throughout. So, yeah. And then often what I'll do is like I'll. I'll write my own string arrangements. Like I'll look at the chord progression, let's say, and then I'll be like, okay, like one, four, five, I'll do like the long bows of to match those chord progressions. Then maybe I'll add some harmonies and then some plucking for, for, uh, for rhythm and then the drum sampler and then some, yeah, vocal harmonies. Then on top of the string harmonies. Yeah. Cool. And what, so, so say for example, the person out there is wanting to start it. What do they need to get today? to start what's the minimum amount that they need to get to start right now to so loop. cyber monday today so say they're on they're not going to be on amazon on cyber, yeah. cyber monday by the time this gets out but you know what i mean but they're on they, they see a good a good loop pedal on, on amazon what do they need to do today to start buy it man if you can buy it buy it or if you're not sure about looping i mean you can always just get one for like 100 euro i'm sure um a very basic one uh and mm-hmm. see how you get on um but uh, like yeah just get it and start and just have fun with it like i would just get really pissed off at myself whenever it wasn't working or like i wasn't that it's just have fun with it and like you, yeah. you'd be surprised at how quickly you get good at it like it's not hard it's you can do it anyone can do it it just takes time and a bit of practice so fair play to you yeah that that, that that's uh, and that, that kind of is is the same for for anything people look at me playing me drums and I'm like anyone can do that it's like you're stamp you're stamping your foot anyway. Just put something underneath, mm. um, and uh, yeah. So I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna give a go at looping again. I'm Dang, gonna give it's it a go. It's great. Um, so much just, fun. Yeah. yeah, I think that's this is the thing is that us as musicians and like you're saying, we kind of live in our own heads and we sort of get when because you're trying to compare compare yourself to your nine to five equivalent. It's you, you don't see the, the the progression. You do tend to get yourself. You do t- tend to get tick and get really really frustrated. Maybe maybe too quick. And you do tend to forget that the reason you started this was because it was fun. It was mm-hmm. a bit of crack. Um, I don't know if you've seen Ted Lasso, but there was a great um, scene in Ted Lasso where it's basically, it's, it's meant to be Roy Keane, but his name is Roy something else. 
and he's it's about football and he's he's talking to the lads. He's like, Did you forget what this is about? It's a fucking game. Go out and play it. Like it's meant to be fun. They don't, never mind all the the like the football matches and the, the sponsorships and all this kind of crack. It's a bit of crack. Go out and have fun. Music is the, is the exact same. Don't be taking yeah. it too serious until you need to take it seriously. And if you need to take it seriously, you're obviously doing something right at that stage anyway. Yeah. And what I've been trying on that note, what I've been trying to get in a good practice of, and I think it's a technique for people with ADHD as well, is like there will be days where I will try, I will just sit and I, I, at my loop station and I'll be standing there and I'm like, okay, I have to get, I have to do another song and I have to get another arrangement for another song to expand my set list because mm-hmm. like I need more time or something for this gig. And and I'll know I have to do it and I will not be productive for five or six hours. I will just not be able to do it effectively. And then so whereas when I feel invigorated and when the dopamine has hit, I can be hyper productive, hyper focused and get it done in mm-hmm. two hours. But I need to be feeling jovial. I need to be feeling yeah. in a in like a gratitude kind of headspace around it. Like, whoa, like stoked to do it. And yeah. so if now there is work ethic, like you have to push through that sometimes and get shit done. Mm. But I work more effectively when I, ta- I just, my brain works differently. So I work, I know now that I work more effectively when I feel a certain way. And so mm-hmm. if I don't feel that way, I will do something else that makes me happy. So maybe like, oh, I don't want to do, loop covers right now I feel like just composing something and I'll just have a bit of crack with that and then I'll feel inspired and then I'll feel better to do it more productive. yeah you can't force creativity it just it'll happen or it won't yeah mm-hmm. yeah on that no what about um I I, I seen you've got nearly 20,000 followers on TikTok mm-hmm. how have you done that how is it was, was that intentional or well Sorry, that, that sounds very that sounds do you know what I mean like that that sounds very oh good for you aren't you a great girl but no, what I meant was that, no. like, did you have a, a particular strategy to grow your TikTok or was that just all natural or what? I'm okay. I am so TikTok chuffed. I just want to have a hot second. I had 5,000 followers like a week and a half ago. And then, really? And, yeah. And then I had two videos go quite viral and I was like, yeah. sweet. Um, and one got picked up by joe.ie and I've got so much work from that platform. TikTok as a platform for musicians is, I mean, it has good things about it. It has not good things about it. Um, yeah. There are, it is problematic. So I think like you can burn bright and then fizzle and yeah, there's no almost instantly. To it. But yeah. for me and my experience with TikTok and the way that I'm choosing to use it at the moment, it has been nothing but beneficial. Um, and I think that's because of what I do. Like, I guess, I guess because what I'm using it for right now isn't necessarily to get an original song out there um mm-hmm. and i can see how that can be draining using that using it mm-hmm. having to use tiktok as a marketing tool i have friends doing it right now and i remember one one guy he was just like i'm so he made a tiktok be like i'm so tired of having to market this on tiktok and it just felt very genuine and then i realized yeah. what he was doing and i was like oh bro like you know like it, so um but it's it's a curse and a blessing for me it's been a blessing because I have just been capturing my day-to-day life, doing what I do, recording collaborations with friends, recording my pulp gigs and putting it out there. And it's gone viral. Like the one that did the first video that went went really, really well was just a grainy video from a shit hot trad session with a band called The Fiddle Case down at uh, Fitz's bar in Doolin. And we were just having the crash. I've seen that that one, yeah. Yeah. And it just, and then putting my story on top of it. Because TikTok as a marketing device is great, as a marketing tool is great because it's a storytelling app, you know? And yeah, for storytellers, people just want a window into a different experience that isn't their own. It's entertainment. So I just share my day to day and I talk about what I do and what it means. So like that video, it was the trad session. Then I was like, oh, I moved here from Canada. The lads invited me up to play. Woohoo! And it went super bad. (laughs) Yeah. One was like, whoa, like so much rhythm. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. Cool. Like, yeah. I don't know. But um, so yes, so that's been great. And then I just started video. And then my friend Louisa May has been phenomenal at encouraging me to do um TikTok. She's a digital marketing strategist, C- CEO of her company. Like she's class. And yes. so she's like, Megan, you need to be on TikTok. Like you would do really well on TikTok. So every day she'd like text and be like, are you working on your TikTok? You need to do three, you need to do your videos, like record your content, record everything, get it out there. It's how you're going to grow. 
once you have a big TikTok following, you can do whatever you want. You can release a cookbook if you want. People will buy it. You know, like you have a following. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like that. So I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, thanks to her encouragement, um, I have now um, grown it. I just, it's kind of consistency. Like some videos just flop. And the best advice was that she's like, just have fun again. Just have fun with it, Meg. She said, she's like, just see what works and just post, post, post. Some things are going to work, but eventually something or some things won't work, but then eventually something will work. And she's absolutely right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, it's just almost it. And then and then I just put a video up from the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh. Again, yeah. like 10 seconds. Like I'm not even doing anything particularly crazy, but it was just 10 seconds of the opening of my show and it uh, of, on the street. It's just like all ethereal elf sounding. And it went viral. It has like 1.1 million views. Got so many followers from it. And But Amazing. then the reason why it's been a great marketing tool is because people who then follow, it's so niche. It is such a targeted audience that yeah. the people that you're getting are really dedicated to what you're doing. Like I have people sign up to my mailing list. Like people are like, when are you releasing more original music? And I'm like, and now all of a sudden I have to be accountable to these 20,000 people that are on my account. You know? Uh -huh. like, yeah. So then it's a motivational tool as well. Okay, brilliant. Mm. That sounds class. I'm I'm taking mental notes mm. because this is it's like you're 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 like the third or fourth person to say that. And it's one of these things. Is like when you're getting this advice, it's like, yeah, but it's not just that simple, is it? But it like it's yeah, not, it's of course it's not just that simple. But it's on the surface of it. If it is just literally just don't like, overthink it. Just have fun with it. Just record everything. Like everything is content. Like just like it's yeah. great. And if you and if you commit time to it, so I. Louisa May would say to me, she'd say, Megan, you have to take your TikTok seriously. And I was like, okay, I'll take it seriously. And then I would just start creating these videos. And she's like, Megan, you're doing really good on TikTok. I told you you'd be good at it. And I was like, thanks, buddy. <laughs> uh, but no, and you have to take it again. Like we were talking about with the nine to five. This is a tool that you have to put hours into in order to see um, output, you know? Yeah, yeah input, of course. Output. So anyway. Of course. And, and so, how, so how much time every day do you put into TikTok then? Like I've slacked now the last two weeks, but maybe like three hours, not every day, maybe three hours every, I do three hours, three times a week, maybe. Okay. It, it would enough. take me like, but then also like I would just be filming things during my life and saving the little clips for later. And then I would spend maybe three hours. Just put them all together. I say three hours. Maybe it would only take me an hour. Like it depends. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Grand. Mental note taken. Uh, cool. What about your single then that you released last year? Tell us yeah. about that. How's that been going? Well, great. I just, you know what? It was my first single. I'm really proud of the music video and the music. I'm happy with it. You know, whatever. It's great. And I'm happy to have that first creation out there. Um, I'm honing my sound. I feel like that music um, is, uh, like the music that I'm creating now is different. And uh, it's more... I don't know. It's like, I don't really know. I'm still finding my sound. I'm putting stuff out there that feels good. That felt good then. And now I'm doing more. So, yeah. And can we expect an album anytime soon? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Once I, once I have money in the bank from the cruise ship gig. <laughs> oh, to record, to record the album? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can do that yourself. I know. You've I got a MacBook. You can, you've got GarageBand. You can do that now. No, I just don't want to. I'd so no? this. It gives me a headache. I would maybe one day I'll hyperfixate on on uh, production, but at this point in time, it's not a skill I really want to put time into learning at the moment. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I, I I I can applaud that. I done sound engineering, and literally five days later, I moved to Spain to play music, and never looked at sound engineering again for about five six years. <laughs> so actually, until I until I started doing. All this stuff and it just sort of the the workflows that I learned were sort of like kind of it was it was it was handy to know but I I yeah uh, um I always wanted to be in the the live room not the control room I was always sitting in the control room recording the fella playing guitar I think and I was like just play that better and I was I I, I was just like yeah I I I wanted to be the the other fella uh, on the yeah, other side I, and I was yeah. always yeah but anyway. So what what about some of these places that um you've gigged? Where is your favorite place that you've gigged? Oh, that's such a hard question. I know, that's I know. My favorite place to gig. Ooh, woo -woo. Or your favorite place that you have have gigged. Um or any sort of mad stories that you've you've come out with. Like that's quite a cool story I about do. getting collected from the pub and the tour bus. You know what? I actually had, I think, my 
yeah, I think it happened very recently, only a few weeks ago. Just because for me on a personal level, it was so rewarding. Um, so I, I had met a, I have met a busker um, at, the, at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Fantastic Scottish singer-songwriter. Goes by the name of Murdo Mitchell. And we just became great mates on the streets and we'd play together. And I really love working with Murdo because he has a wonderful work ethic and a fantastic, fantastic skill set. And he, like, so I plugged in with him on the street and we just, it was fucking great. <laughs> and then he was like, what are you doing on September 16th? And I was like, am I playing with you, man? And he's like, yeah, I'm flying you to London. Like, you have to do my showcase with me. And I was like, sweet. So um, the showcase was at St. Pancras Church in London. Oh, cool. It's a small venue. It's there's, you know, it's, it's, it, but for me, it was a venue I had wanted to play for years. Yeah. With the right people. Like I wanted, for me, back when I was in Canada, like doing my final year of uni and I was just like, I want to be a folk rocker. I want to play with these. I want to be part of this amazing folk songwriter scene coming out of London and um and and Ireland and I said man and I had seen videos of people playing St Pancras like I just it's just a well respected kind of underground venue and it was like the band the session players that we had for that gig he got amazing players who are now wonderful friends and we just all of us had the best crap it was just the best for me on a personal level it was so rewarding because i was playing with great people doing the exact genre that i wanted to be doing after choosing to leave the celtic show world to play stuff like this and to find Fantastic. people like this and so oh my god like isabel on cello is class we became great mates she has like a three-year master's degree in classical cello performance she is shit hot and the two right. of us just were cracking on like oh and then the drum, everything, everything was just brilliant. Awesome. And it was sold out. It was a sold out. It was just packed. It was great. Amazing stuff. That's a, that's a great story. I love it. Yeah, it so awesome. literally, it was just like, I'm flying you to London and, and, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. He's such a Such a that's, that's, uh, that, that, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. I love those stories because it is, it is so like, yeah. when, when you're a kid and you, you hear about it, it's like, oh, no, just, and this guy was like, oh, you're coming to London with me. And you don't, you don't think, you think that that only ever happens in like, to other people are in like the films and to hear that it actually does yeah. happen is uh i know if i was a kid hearing that i i, I, I me as an adult i think that's uh so so yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what about the thing from the streets like the people i've met on the street have been fantastic i got a gig with codaline because jay walked by and like followed me on instagram and like two years later he's like do you want to play the late late show with us and i was like yeah man like everything happens for me from the street everything amazing like, yeah it's great like so much session work has come out of the street and like um, and also, um, like agencies, like the agencies I work for now, it's all because like they saw the show on the street, you know? So anyway, yeah, it's really good. And actually I'm really excited to play with that band. We're doing two sold out shows at the Barrowlands in Glasgow first week of oh, December amazing. and we're opening for Dylan John Thompson. And so, and then on the sixth as well. So we have three gigs. And again, it's just when I left, cause I was a bit scared to leave the Celtic show world. Because yeah. I was like, I'm playing for 7,000 people and touring the world. Like, this is so much fun. But it yeah. wasn't. And it was, it, was, it was such a beautiful time in my career. And it was so mm. rewarding. But my priorities changed. I really wanted to create music with yeah. leaders. I didn't want to be part of a production anymore. And so yeah. I was like, I don't know these people yet. But I'm going to just keep putting myself out there. And maybe they'll come. So that's why. Yeah. The St. Pancras gig, the Glasgow gigs are very just rewarding. It's a passion project. It's great. It's yeah, a- I, it's it's so funny that that's um, like it's it's almost too much of a good thing when you're like someone someone else would absolutely give anything to be doing, to be touring the world and doing what you're doing and stuff. And just because it's not, I was exactly the same when I used to live in Spain. We basically lived like absolute rock stars. We used to just like get out of bed at like seven in the evening, go and play our gig at like ten play onto like one or something like that and then you're out every single night until yeah. like nine in the morning like you'd finish off like just by drinking cans down on the beach every single night and yeah. that was amazing and i done it for two years and it was just it, it got to the point where i was just like this is not my dream anymore this is someone else's dream it's still mm-hmm. fantastic and i'd love to go and do it mm-hmm. again at some point but i know full yeah. well that i'd literally i'd go and do it one for, for one day and that'd be me i'd be fed up of it um, and it's so weird to think just because your your priorities change like you say um, 
It's so strange. Um, so th- in, in that same vein, then, if someone's listening, I know you're sort of at the, I would, I would say pretty much at, not at the start of your career, but you're, 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 you're not too far into your career that you you'd still remember what it's, it's, it's like to start out. Um, how would, what's the best bit of advice you could give to little Meg listening to home that yeah, wants to friend. be, wants to do what you're doing or wants to have the same sort of success that she sees you having? What, yeah. Um, what, surround, what, what yourself, you surround yourself with people who are doing it because if you surround yourself with people who are older than you who are better than you always surround yourself with people who are better than you because mm-hmm. and by better I mean like you're going to get to that point but yep. if you if, if you surround yourself with people who know who are doing it you will be held accountable so there's a group of women that I love dearly that's my friends group in London and they're all bad bitches like they are arts like they they are slaying their creative careers in the arts, in the visual arts industry, in uh, film and television. And they hold me accountable because I'm like, like subtly, just by hanging out with these people, I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. like this is a legitimate craft. Society tells me this is not a legitimate way to live my life and that I should be doing something nine mm-hmm. to five. But yeah. as in like, you know, all self-employed people struggle with this, I'm sure. But I'm anyway, to be surrounded by people who are doing something similar. It creates legitimacy and it makes you it makes you work harder and be better. And uh, so surround yourself with people who are doing it. And then uh, just throw yourself into the fire. Like just do it and just keep doing it and keep failing really embarrassingly at it. Is that the point where like, I just, keep, I just kept failing and it was so okay. funny. Like everything was a failure. Like everything was going so bad. Like so yeah. everyone from Ireland's got talent and they told me I would, I was not a good fiddle player and that I like I couldn't sing. <laughs> well, who told you that? On TV. Like it was so Who said that? Who, which one of them said that to you? Oh, like all of oh all of them. Like yeah. Who are the judges on Ireland's Got Talent? Oh, I can't even remember. It was just yeah. Right, well, listen, if anyone from Ireland's Got Talent is listening, no, I'm calling every single one of you out. Fuck yeah. Gino or Straw. Huh? But yeah. it was hilarious. Like and I was like, that's okay. Like, that wasn't for me. Like, okay. And I was like, mm. I, but it was great. What was great is that I actually just didn't believe them because like, I was like, well, I'm, good working, view. Full-time, like, I'm working full time doing this. Like you're trying to make good TV. Like you're yeah. just trying to create drama, I'm sure. And they didn't like me and that's okay. Lots of people don't, you know, and that's grand. Like lots of people yeah. don't like what I do and that's okay. That's that they're not my target audience. Like, exactly. I'm not going to exactly. waste anything. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a fella that was on, um, the two Johnny's podcast, and I cannot for the life of me think of what his name is. Ray something. He's like a, a fitness guy, a fitness instructor, like a big, uh, famous fitness instructor in Ireland. And but one thing he did say that I remember is says there's no such thing as a failure. There's only an attempt. Yeah. So that's like, uh, I think a really good way of looking at it. Oh yeah, like fail, fail, fail. Like even going to the fringe this summer it could have been the biggest fail, but it ended up being the best success. Like I got connected with a whole crew of musicians in London and Glasgow from it. And then also I got a bougie ass cruise gig. Like they had an agent come to the pitch and like offer this cruise contract for my loop show. And I was like, sweet. And so I like to, so now I'm on the cusp of like really living and building and continuing to build and continuing yeah. to find the puzzle pieces that I need to live a creative life with freedom and flexibility. Brilliant. Amazing. So and now for 2023, I'll do a few months on the cruise ship. And then I'll have financial freedom and security to do passion projects and then to take nice. on stuff that I might not have had time to do before. Yeah, so I would have been doing gigs that were less paid. Uh, and yeah. I would have had to prototype have to live, you know, but now I cruise, I just go away and do that. And then and then also like also just at the same time, there's also agency work that pays really, really well in Ireland now. So I can just yeah. do that a few times a week. And, like, Brilliant. Where are you, where are you going on, on the cruises? Uh Miami is the first one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course it is. Yeah, yeah. in Miami, yeah. unreal, yeah. unreal. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and it's for the brilliant. So, which is great. So I was like, woo! It's like easy. I just bring myself, and like, yeah, it's great. And away you go. Well, I'm I'm really looking forward to the TikToks because that's another thing that I follow is uh, cruise musicians and what they do, and it's oh, it's amazing. <laughs> so I'm really, really looking forward to like the the TikTok vlogs from that. That's going to be brilliant. 
thanks. And my friend plays me. She's like, Megan, you have to TikTok the cruise. And I was like, okay, I'm yeah. like, <laughs> You have to TikTok everything. You have to TikTok yeah. absolutely everything. Uh, so before we finish up, what is it that, um, is there anything you're working on now? What am I working on now? Yes. So I'm actually, well, I'm writing music at the moment. And right. I'm looking for the right producer uh, to kind of experiment with my sound. And so I'm going to be, I would like to start recording another single in uh, January when I'm back from Ooh. Miami. And yeah, so I'm going to release that uh, hopefully before spring <laughs> and uh, we'll see how we go. And um, I'm actually recording this week with a great duo. They're called Scoff and they are okay. fantastic. I heard their EP. They're fresh on the circuit and their EP blew me away. I thought it, it was class. And so I met them. I was playing Doolin Folk Fest with another great band uh, from the area, uh, the Davies Brothers. And I was playing with them. And then that, then the, the Scoff lads had been playing the day before. So we met there. And I was like, we, ever since the summer, we're like, we must get together because I heard their music and I was like, oh, it would be great with some loops now and some strings. It was just, oh, it, was, it, it would just be so much fun. So we had our nice. first practice. So we're I'm rehearsing with them and I have a few gigs lined up with them in Dublin in the new year. So it'll be great. Lots of good creative Brilliant. things. And then, yeah, and then the Glasgow gig's coming up soon and the cruise, so. Yeah, that's amazing. The, the Glasgow gigs, unfortunately, for anyone listening, will have already happened mm -hmm. by the time uh, this comes out. But um, yeah, that, that that still sounds amazing. I'm so jealous you're getting to play Barrowlands. That's absolutely classic. Like, I'm so excited. Um, it's yeah, just... no, that, and you're going to have the time of your life. Yeah. Um, you yeah. really, really are. Uh, that That's amazing. Um, cool. Well, I'll tell you what, let's um, start finishing up here. Now we're going to hop into a quick fire round, just a couple of random questions, put you on the spot and have the crack with. So let's start off. What is your job title in three words or less? Musician, loop artist, session player. Right. We're, we're going to take loop artist as, as like a hyphen and session player as a hyphen. So that's technically three words. That'll do. Grand job. Um, what word do you find hard to pronounce? Ooh. Oh. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to. Okay. When I first came to Ireland, I got into the oh, I'm, going to, I'm going to love this. I can tell already I'm going to love this. I, I, when I first came to Ireland, I had to go to Dunleary. And so I popped in the cab and I was like, hi, hello. Um, I need to go to Dunlauga hair. <laughs> <laughs> and had to be very embarrassingly. So I live in, L in La Hinch now. Well, and it's time in La Hinch area. And yeah. when I first came to La Hinch, it's this amazing surfing town. And I came down to surf. And... I thought it was being all cool. I'd like posted this picture of like my surfboard on Instagram. This is many years yeah. ago. It's like buried beneath everything. Thank God. And I changed the hashtag, but I went, I did hashtag L-A-H-I-N-G-E, La Hinge. Because I thought, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone doesn't know, it's spelled L-A-H-I-N-C-H. Like, uh, oh, Egypt. That that's hilarious. Dunle my, one of my best mates uh, grew up in Dunleary. So I spent loads of time in Dunleary. It's one of my favorite places in the... Actually, her ma is in Clannet. Uh, her ma is Maya yeah. Brennan. So oh, I, used, I used yes. to spend loads of time in Maya Brennan's house in, oh, in Dunleary. So yeah. Jealous. So cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there you go. Now, uh, Dunleary is... And actually, that, that never even occurred to me that Dunleary would be a hard thing to pronounce because in, in my head, it's like, blatantly obvious but you're like oh, of course that's easy for me to say so Dunleary great stuff um, going on from that what is your favourite word oh Pad Thai man it's my favourite food <laughs> fair enough oh, Pad Thai oh I'll tell you what speaking of uh, food right yeah uh, I, I, just when you said Pad Thai I know that poutine is like a, a really cool Canadian thing yeah. is there any cool like Canadian words like what's your favourite specifically Canadian like word or slang or something like I that. I love buddy. I really miss hearing that. Whenever I'm home, everyone's like, hey buddy, how are you, buddy? Right. Like, really? I'm over there. And like even when Canadians are angered, they're like, oh buddy down the road. He broke into my car. <laughs> you know? Well really? Yeah, yeah. Buddy down oh, the road. God. Like, oh buddy down the road doing this, buddy that, buddy that. Yeah, it's very funny. <laughs> I used to hear hear that in Dublin all the time in like taxi like, like taxi drivers. Hey we your buddy. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, good stuff, buddy. Love it. Mm. Cool. Uh, tea or coffee? Oh, tea. Fair play to you. Now, uh, some people have given me, like, different criteria for when tea and when coffee. But So, are you just tea or have you got, like, conditions? 
I tend, well, I, I'll have coffee sometimes. I love a nice coffee, but mm, I have tea mostly. <laughs> okay, fair play to you. Yeah, no, because a lot of people have been like, like tea unless. I find tea is like a nice little ritual of relaxation. Like we don't do this in Canada. And so it's like a little moment to just take for yourself. And it's like a little treat. And for me, being self-diagnosed with ADHD, it's like a little dopamine hit. I'm like, ooh, snack, fun, woo. <laughs> I am literally going to call the podcast Ritual of Relaxation because that is the best thing I've ever heard. Ritual of mm -hmm. Relaxation. Yeah. These little rituals in your day-to-day -day can be just so helpful to help with anxiety and just to send Fantastic. Fantastic. Cool. What Disney character would you be? Brave, Merida, the Scottish sensation. Oh yeah, my God, I, yeah. the soundtrack is amazing. Oh my God, Julie Follis and uh, Mumford and & Sons and, and Birdie. Oh my God. Oh really? Yeah, I've never actually goodness. seen, I've never seen that one. I know exactly the one you're on about with the green dress and stuff. Like, but, oh, um, it's the soundtrack is dynamite. It's such yeah, a good soundtrack. I, I, I think that's quite, um, that, that's, that's quite apt. Um, okay, last one here now. And this is the uh, the million euro question in your case. What would you be doing if you weren't a musician, loop artist, mm -hmm. and whatever the last one I, we, we, we said was? I'm ashamed of myself. That I can't remember what it was when it was only like two minutes ago. Um, I might have gone to pursue an internship and work for the UN um, and providing oh, wow. humanitarian aid in war zones. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, humanitarian aid um, in that field or documentary filmmaker, um, which I'd like to do down the road or just working in film and television in some way. Very good. Okay, that's, mm -hmm. um, that's brilliant. That, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, that, 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 uh, that's one I wasn't expecting. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering, I, I thought you might go down the route of, of something to do with your, your international thingy. Yeah, so yeah, sorry. working I can't in, what in was war called. zones and humanitarian aid would have been um, what I oh, said. Is that what that is that what that is to do with, is it? Yeah. No. Oh, okay, very good. Well, there you go. You learn something new every day. Hey, well, cool. Well, listen, Meg, before we finish up, where can people find you? Um, TikTok. <laughs> TikTok and Instagram. And I wish I could say Facebook. And if any listeners or anyone works for Facebook, my Facebook page that I have spent years building up off the street, like people meticulously seeing me on Grafton Street, typing my name into Facebook, following mm -hmm. me on Facebook. And a few, it's like 4,000 or 5,000 or something, I think, yeah. it has gone completely missing. It just disappeared one day. I don't understand why. I don't, oh, I've, no. I've written to Facebook. I've lost everything. And like, there was boomers on that, man. Like, they all actually bought my music. Like, they yeah, they'll, they, they'll, they'll buy CDs. Yeah. So, oh, no. Like, they were the ones who actually paid for, when, for my single one. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, man. Like, <laughs> I well actually that that's very true because when I was trying to find you there earlier on, I couldn't find you, and I was like, "Surely she's on Facebook." I'm just being yeah. stupid. I was like, yeah. I've, "I've typed this in wrong." But I've had it oh, for no. years. It's been a huge like it's really important to me my Facebook page, and it's just gone yeah. missing. So I don't know why. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Here, hey Zuckerberg, fucking get the finger out, lad. Sort yeah. it out. Thanks. That's Barry. shocking. It's really scary. Oh. I'm like, oh shit. Like that is really scary. Correspondence I had with clients in the past. Yeah. I can't access it, so. Yeah, I've literally, like, see, see if, if we get booked for a wedding or anything like that, I have details in Facebook Messenger. Exactly. Like, I'll, I'll take a note of them, but, like, the, the uh, of the summary, but, yeah, oh, that's, um, ah. Oh, it's very frustrating. Good for you. Well, I'll, I'll keep everything across for you that um, you. They, they, they get that back. Thank you. Um, and, it's, and, just and, and motivated me to, it's just been extra motivation. I'm taking it as a incentive and an extra push to push TikTok, because <laughs> now I have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So people can find you at TikTok at what's your, what's your handle? At uh, Meg what's your Lagrand. Handle on that? Yeah. Meg so Lagrand. Lagrand. L-A-G-R-A-N-D-E. And it's my website as well. It's meglagrand.com. Fantastic. Great. Well, listen, Meg, yeah. thanks very much for your time today. And um, best of luck with everyone. Keep in touch. Very. It was an absolute pleasure. What a hoot. The time flew. Oh, my God. We've been chatting for over an hour. Different. This has been great. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thanks very much, Meg. Thank you very much.